these calls are recorded and uploaded into DevOps and Cloud YouTube yeah. community. You yeah, okay yeah. with that? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So let's get started. Why don't you uh, give me a brief introduction about yourself and you know what are you doing at the moment? Uh, sure. sure. Uh, so I have uh, 10 years overall uh, work experience in IT industry uh, in which uh, from the past seven years I have been working in TCS and within TCS uh, I started working as infrastructure analyst where I worked for five years and then in 2022 I switched to a, a, a basic role of um, site reliability engineer. Uh, why I would say uh, as a site reliability engineer because I was involved in a migration work closely in a migration work wherein a, a, a suite of applications from one data center were migrated from one data center to one data center to a more secure data center and when I say those applications that means uh, they're com com they were completely migrated to the uh, more secure data center. It was basically a lift and shift operation. And this work closely aligns with the uh, site reliability engineering. So I can say that, you know, I have experience of site reliability engineer from past, you know, 1.5 years. And lately I have been uh, working on the um, uh, automation of monitoring aspect in the platform where I have been working on the uh, application performance monitoring basically automation task as well as on the uh, automation of the monitoring of the infrastructure uh, and also i am uh, also i am uh, basically working on setting up a uh, setting up a ci cd pipeline as well uh, to automate the deployment process you know because you know uh, the releases which happen within the platform in the production you know uh, um, those basically happen manually so to automate that a CI/CD pipeline basically has been proposed, uh, you know, to reduce the manual effort as much as possible. So I am basically uh, working on that also. Now, um, uh, currently, more actively, I'm working on the application performance monitoring part. Um, but you know, I'm trying. I'm during my uh, during each day, I try to give you know uh, a, some some amount of time to all these three things. And um, so, but. Uh, my goal is to uh, get into a role where I can uh, work with core DevOps technologies like Terraform, Kubernetes in real time. Because outside my working hours, I have been upscaling myself in you know these technologies. But uh, my goal basically is to attain uh, uh, work experience in these technologies, uh, so that you know the learnings which I have done, I can you know um, leverage those uh, in um, in the in the real world environment. Yeah, I think thanks a lot for that. Um, as I can see, predominantly your expertise is kind of laid out in DevOps and which yeah. in AWS, I would like to focus, uh, you know, the upcoming call in, in those areas. And for example, if you feel that any question is kind of, uh, you know, um, is something not relevant out of your expertise, you know, feel free to pass that. I don't want sure. you to be, you know, you know, kind of paying uh, attention to it and then thinking of it and then you know uh, right. making a pause along the lines yeah. if you if you're not at all comfortable just just feel free to say no and i don't sure. know so that i can sure. pass to the next question I so should. once we pass all the questions probably i could share the feedback uh, you know how the call went and what are the areas that i you would need to you know uh, probably concentrate if there's any gaps that i have found sure. in the upcoming 20 minutes is that I okay should. Yeah, sure, Shamila. Thank you. I think uh, let me start with the first question. As you're predominantly based out of a DevOps guy, let me try juggling what you do much onto DevOps. My first question um, is around uh, how do you secure your infrastructure mm -hmm. as a code or your DevOps pipeline, especially with secret management? Okay, so uh, in my personal projects, which I have listed in my resume, so last year I basically um, I did a master's course from Liverpool John Moose University, wherein I had built I my research work was related to Dev, DevSecOps pipeline. I mean DevSecOps uh, concept. So to practically implement that concept, I basically built a DevSecOps pipeline, wherein I had. Um, um you know embedded security in, at every stage of the pipeline because you know um 
DevOps means to to uh, reduce the silos between development and operations team, and also its main aim to is to increase the delivery process, in, increase decrease the uh, time of the delivery process as much as possible. So, but you know, in that uh, uh, mindset, people often overlook the security aspects involved in the pipeline. So, either they basically um, uh, security either is not considered at all, or it is something which is considered afterward. You know, when the uh, application is deployed in the production. environment then security aspect comes into picture but uh, obviously that is not healthy from security perspective uh, because uh, during the during any stage of the pipeline a uh, security breach is likely to happen right so uh, to basically um, increase the resilience from security perspective from all over pipeline um, uh, i uh, the principle which i i mean uh the thing which i did in that dev sec ops pipeline was that i embedded security aspect at every stage of the pipeline so let's say when the starting stage when the code is checked in from the repository so i had used the uh, you know post commit hook post commit hooks in order to basically detect any sensitive information within the repository which should not be basically a part of the deployment which should not be carried forward uh, to the deployment uh, to the i mean in this uh, pipeline process and then when the um, basically build operation happened then i had used the sas uh, mechanism uh, no i'm mean, sorry sas timing mean, uh, uh, static uh, code uh, basically testing so wherein basically i was able to detect the vulnerabilities associated with the code right uh, then once the um, build operation was completed and testing was happened then uh, the image was created you know from that operation so the docker image which was created that also might be composed of vulnerabilities so i had used trivi use a trivi tool to basically um, uh, check the vulnerabilities associated with the uh, uh, built applications image and once these vulnerabilities were detected then i basically had to you know uh, you know um say cured those over things and then the image was moved to the docker hub which is the image repository and from the docker hub the image was deployed into the kubernetes cluster now when the image is deployed then you know the vulnerabilities in the real time environment also are likely to happen so basic uh, so to combat that i used the dash dynamic application security testing technique to you know detect the vulnerabilities um, in the running environment and to cure those and uh, once the application was deployed and those vulnerabilities were also cured then i basically used the prometheus and grafana you know to uh, basically have the real time metrics uh, of the application so through these uh, basically techniques i was able to you know uh, take care of the security aspect uh, uh, pretty much uh, throughout the whole uh, pipeline creation Yeah, as you have already touched based on uh, SaaS and DAS, um, I would like to give me yeah. the key differences between these two tools. Ah, uh, sure. So basically, SaaS means that uh, means the static uh, application. Uh, sorry, I'm basically I'm not able to recall the full form of that. But uh, from concept perspective, you know, uh, SaaS means then when you detect the vulnerabilities from a static code. the code basically which is uh, placed in a repository so it might be related to the refactor uh, so uh, the, uh, the vulnerabilities might be related to the redundant uh i think i've kept alex uh, lost you for a second sorry i'm sorry it was the no problem no problem so dash basically is uh, sorry um, i mean sas is related to the you know when uh, analyzing the code at the static so at when i say static means the code which is at the rest or you can say which is in the repository which basically um, hasn't been uh, you know deployed in the real time environment yet so the vulnerabilities can be related to the code like if basically uh, uh, redundant uh, packages let's say we have a python code and if you if someone has used the redundant uh, import statements or basically uh, code refactoring is required you know so those sort of basic vulnerabilities are something which can be detected by the sast right or if basically any unforeseen related security gap can be uh, traced from that code then basically um, sast technique is used to you know detect all these things now when the code dash means that the uh, dynamic application security testing so when the code basically is deployed in the production then uh, you know um, uh, 
the uh, the security aspects can happen you know in the production environment also right which basically like uh, related to the uh, the 404 uh, code you know uh, if some uh, i mean if uh, someone tries to access any applications uh, code and basically if uh, uh, that uh, the page is not able to get access 404 code then this is something i think which can, can be uh, you know uh, uh, catch a caught up using the dash technique so i think this is the difference yeah and i can also see that you have worked on ansible uh, you know completely in you know in few projects so probably i would want to phrase a question on on the lines yeah. sure. uh, you know tell me you know a couple of github uh, sorry ansible handlers that you have used uh, so I had used, uh, you know, Ans uh, Ansible. I did not use much, although. So okay. Ans Ansible, I use basically from the con pure configuration management itself. So uh, I use Ansible, you know, when the uh, EC2 instance were cre was created using Terraform, then I use Ansible to install Docker uh, in, uh, you know, in those instances. So that. Or can uh, you difference, or I mean, or can you give me a, you know, uh, a key differentiator between ansible and a couple of other configuration management tools like chef and puppet i mean when is ansible is more preferred approach compared to the others yeah um well um, uh, sorry i am not basically aware about uh, okay. because uh, as far as i know all of these tools basically fulfill the common criteria which is configuration management but uh, why basically Ansible is preferred over the other tools? That is basically something I'm not really sure about. No, no problem. That's okay. We can just pass that question. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Probably let me go into Kubernetes a bit because I can see Kubernetes, uh, you know, in your resume quite a bit. Can you tell me a difference between a pod and a container? Sure. So pod basically is a runtime environment of an application, and uh, basic and container. Uh, basically is uh, uh, you know under the hood uh, is something which runs under the hood of a pod so um, i mean container basically container is a runtime and uh, you know and uh, you can say aspect of the image or applications image and uh, pod basically uh, is able to run because of the container so uh, now if any application basically is for uh, uh, runs in the form of uh, you know container uh, then in order to run that uh, application in the kubernetes cluster it basically needs to be configured in the form of the pod which basically is the smallest deployment object uh, in the kubernetes cluster okay and can you tell me the difference between config map and a secret when should we use you know one and another so config map is uh, so the key difference I think uh, between these two is that uh, secrets uh, are used when we need to store the confidential information like passwords, security tokens, etc. While config map is used uh, should be used when uh, we basically do not intend to store anything you know which is which can be sensitive. So I believe this is the key difference. Yeah, and can you tell me what's uh, persistent volume and what's persistent volume claims? Um, okay. Uh, Kubernetes. These are two Kubernetes objects. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, I think I am currently forgetting that uh, because <laughs> it's been a while since I have you know uh, refreshed my Kubernetes concept. So I think I need to revisit to those. I'm sorry about yeah, that. No problem. No problem. And do you know how do you scale your Kubernetes nodes? Uh, and what are the different scaling methodologies that we have in Kubernetes? Uh, sure. So basically, um, the scaling methodologies which we have in Kubernetes are uh, replica sets and deployments. Uh, so through that, you know, the application can be scaled in the runtime. But uh, the key difference between replica set and deployment is that, uh, you know, if you scale any application, uh, you know, uh, pods of any application, if whether you scale up or scale down using replica set. Uh, but if you make any change, basically in the replica set, then those changes do not appear in the runtime environment uh, directly. So uh, you Can basically you rephrase the question, uh, you know, uh, a bit more. How do yeah. you perform scaling over the node groups in Kubernetes. Um, I mean, think of a EKS hmm. cluster where you mm -hmm. want to scale the nodes, scale the nodes, not the pods. Okay, okay. Uh, all right. You know, so, so what are the different scaling technologies or techniques that you should use? Okay, uh, sure. So it, it is basically horizontal scaling and vertical scaling. 
so horizontal scaling is when you basically you know uh, replicate the number of pods and uh, vertical scaling is instead of that instead of replication when you prefer to you know increase the um, configuration of the particular pod itself let's say you increase the uh, amount of cpu the amount of memory of any pod so i believe these are the two scaling techniques okay so now let's go into docker can you explain me the steps that you take to create a docker image for a node.js application and to store it you know in probably let's say ecr so what give me the step by step you know techniques or or the steps that you take to perform this whole process here sure so basically <clears throat> Uh, in case of any Node.js application, firstly, we need a base image, right? Uh, when we start, so we need to write a Docker file from which we need a base image uh, because it needs to create an environment. Otherwise, uh, the image won't be able to get created. Then we basically need to include the, um, uh, in the Docker file, we need to specify the, um, the place where we need to store the image. And along with that, we uh, some other parameters basically need to be uh, required. I mean, need to be inserted. Then once we have the Docker file ready, we basically need to uh, run the uh, uh, basically command to convert that Docker file into an image. And once that image is created, we need to basically uh, uh, you know run uh, convert that image into a runtime container. And uh, once that container basically is created, and it, uh, the, if the application works after testing, then um, we need basically need to um, you know uh, migrate that uh, image to the ECR basically Elastic Container uh, Repository in it, which is the AWS service, and uh, obviously for moving to that we need to have the required uh, necessary privileges. Uh, when once those privileges are sorted, then we can you know migrate that uh, image in the ECR, which basically can act as a repository you know for storing that image. Yeah. And uh, can you tell me about the argument called entry point in Docker file? What does it mean and when should I use it? Sure. So entry point basically is required to be used when, uh, when we have any uh, command which we need to run. So it's like he, uh, as soon if we intend to run any command as soon as the Docker Im Docker Im uh, container is created, then we need to embed that command into the uh, basically um, in the uh, I can say entry point. Sorry. So let's say if we basically are creating any uh, Ubuntu based container, so in which basically we have used the base image of Ubuntu, then as soon as that Ubuntu uh, in uh, the con container is created then if we let's say we need to update the packages as soon as the container is created using sudo apt get uh, update command then we basically need to use that in the entry point uh, definition of that uh, command uh, while the uh, well the other one i am not able to recall <laughs> i'm sorry about that no problem no problem that's i think fine. i need to revisit my concepts i think it's been a while i think need to revise the things no problem. That's fine. And have you heard about Kubernetes uh, API gateway? Uh, I have heard about that, but I don't think I have ever used it. So okay, um, tell me about different ingress solutions that we have in Kubernetes. Solutions. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not aware about that's that. Fine, that's fine, that's fine. And for example, uh, I mean, have you, have you, uh, you know, worked on any real time, uh, you know, experience? I mean, have you have any real time experience on handling Kubernetes clusters, whether it could be, you know, any troubleshooting scenarios? Have you part of any of them? So I just want to see, you know, and pose a question in terms of the troubleshooting space and see how comfortable are you at? Uh, well, I had tackled, uh, so I think, a few scenarios, trouble related troubleshooting scenarios uh, with respect okay. to Kubernetes in personal projects, but not in the real time because, you know, I don't have any real time experience with Kubernetes yet. Yeah, that's fine. Maybe let me see how much knowledge that you've grabbed over the troubleshooting space. Um, so I have a container um, wherein which I have trigger an Nginx pod over there. Um, so my Nginx pod has a container in it. And uh, for some reason, I couldn't get into uh, the container. I'm, I'm facing an error. Um, you know, 
it just says that code it could not get into the container but nothing else what are the probable uh, you know scenarios in which i can see this error and just imagine anything that comes up to your mind just give me the scenarios doesn't need to be like one or two whatever comes to your mind in this situation what you do how do you troubleshoot further yeah so um i i can think of two scenarios basically <clears throat> the first one could be the image itself now the, if the image through which that container is trying to get created you know so my uh, container is up and running oh, okay 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 all right yeah, it it okay. is it is it is successful it's running and i don't have any issue with the container it's only that i am facing issue while getting into it uh okay so it might be uh, that Uh, the reason could be related to the um, insufficient, or we can say the resource contention, uh, the insufficient memory and CPU usage, uh, you know, which is expected to, for a pod uh, to come up. Basically, uh, that basically, uh, and uh, those amount of resources are not able to get allocated, you know, uh, for the pod during its, uh, you know, creation, or you can say during its uh, um, uh, starting. uh which basically might be the reason you know for that pod not able to come up and uh, um you know as soon as it tries to tries to come up it crashes automatically so this might be the reason and uh, uh i think uh, maybe uh, the tolerance and taint, uh, taint that also basically might be the reason associated with uh, no no okay not so no not that also so that is with respect to the nos I don't think yeah. that would be the. Yeah. the how do you how do you get into a container? Tell me the command. Um. So we use the uh, exec command, I think. Yeah. Do you remember the syntax of the exec command? Um. I'm sorry, not right now. I. <laughs> okay. I have to revisit the things. I think. Yeah. 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 So if you don't use the interactive based, um, you know, terminal to get into the container, even though it 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 is up and running, container is healthy. There's no issue with that. Pod is totally fine. It's just that if you, you know, don't use the interactive terminal with the option hyphen i, then you cannot get into the container. That could be one of the reason as well. Uh, but not all. But it could be the one of the place where you yeah. can think of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Let's, yeah. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, okay. I would like to pose on something on cloud, uh, which is in you know, irrespective of AWS or Azure. I just want to see what do you know much on cloud space. So tell me the differences between route table and security group. yeah so <clears throat> route table okay so security group uh, basically uh, is used uh, you know it basically acts as an uh, as a security guard for any instance okay so uh, since i basically know about aws so basically in aws when you create an ec2 instance right a virtual machine you can say so security group acts as a guard basically for that security uh, for that machine because you know it um, uh, it is a is a state of it's a, you know comprises of the uh, rules inbound rules and outbound rules which basically secure the ec2 instance to ensure that only the required traffic at, uh, at the required ports basically is about uh, is allowed to enter and rest basically can be uh, blocked and uh, but you know with respect to the security groups they are basically are straightforward so once you configure the inbound rules you don't need to configure the outbound rules so as soon as yes, you so uh, yeah. you 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 touch base on the right point where because i'm comparing route tables with security group yeah 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 what you have already told me that uh, one is stateful and what's the yeah. other see other other is basically nacls so uh, network access no, i am not talking about nocls yeah, uh, yeah. so uh, what's route table what route table handles yeah, yeah. is yeah, it stateless right. or stateful i think you're muted i can't hear you well uh, ankit I, i can't hear you sorry about again okay so basically uh, nacl uh, oh, sorry not nacl route tables basically is this stateful uh, yeah. or you can say no it's not stateful stateless basically because you know in route table you have to uh, provide everything so route table is primarily used when you need to associate uh, one resource with uh, basically a particular cidr group so if i basically talk in terms of aws 
in case you need to make any instances public, private instances uh, basically public, you need to associate um, the IGW Internet Gateway with that basic with the subnet of that instance in order to basically make that instances public. So you know you have to explicitly provide the configuration the uh, route table. So I think basically route table from that perspective is you know a stateless because it doesn't assume anything on its own. Yeah. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, do you know how does the DNS work? Um, probably you can take off any sort of DNS, cloud, Azure DNS, AWS one, I don't mind, but tell me how DNS works. Uh, and you have an application, maybe xyz.com. You wanted to expose it to internet and what are the steps that you take to ensure that any users who are accessing xyz.com comes and reaches your static page that you have posted somewhere in S3 or maybe EC2 instance? Yeah. <clears throat> so firstly, um, for the uh, first important thing is uh, by default, any EC2 instance uh, within AWS cloud is private. So we need to basically make it public. And to make it public, we need to basically associate uh, the subnet of that instance uh, with the IGW, which is Internet Gateway, through a route table. Right? This is the first step. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, once basically that is done, then basically we, uh, you know, once uh, then we need to connect to the instance where we, wherein we need to host the application. Right? Let's say if we just in uh, host. Maybe simple... you won't tell me about. I, I'm. 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 Um, I'm okay. Uh, you are able to reach your EC2 instance uh, mm -hmm. from the public internet. It just only tell me the DNS part of it. How okay. do you handle abc.com or xyz.com? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I try to access, reaches your static mm -hmm. page on EC2. Okay. Just tell me the DNS, how the DNS stuff works mm -hmm. before it reaches EC2. Yeah. Sure. So uh, for DNS, I think uh, the we firstly need to ensure that the instance created need to have a public IP address as well as the public DNS name. For which, basically, if we create that instance through Terraform, we need to uh, ensure uh, you know there are two settings associated which we need to specify in the VPC of that ins of the subnet of that instance. So once basically those are configured, then uh, the first thing for DNS basically needs uh, which basically are required to have the domain uh, DNS name and the public IP address. So you know once uh, instance is created, those appear basically in the settings of that instance. And then the most important thing is we need to open the um, you know inbound rules and outbound rules you know at the required ports. So if the application is required to be accessed, the minimum criteria to open to uh, get 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 that access is to open the inbound rule at port number 80, right? Port number 80, uh, the inbound rules need to be opened at port number 80, and the outbound rules also actually uh, at least need to be ensured that they are opened on the port number 80. And uh, I think once we meet these prerequisites, then basically we can expect the user, you know, to access, to be able to access the app. So, do you know anything about the DNS records that needs to be configured? Um, uh, well, uh, as far as my experience is concerned, you know, whenever I have hosted any application in my personal project in AWS, I didn't basically have to touch base on DNS records and all. But uh, okay, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, that's fine then. Um, so let me ask a couple of questions around uh, the databases. Tell me the differences between RDS and a DynamoDB. Yeah, so RDS basically, is, um, you know, is an instance of relational database. So relational databases are known to, you know, um, to structure data in a particular format, like in the form of tables, right? Uh, while DynamoDB is an instance of NoSQL database, NoSQL database, uh, you know, do not have any uh, constraint regarding format, you know, for showing the data, like, you know, it can be uh, uh, like, like uh, it can be MongoDB or you know uh, it can be DynamoDB. No, DynamoDB is some I think most popular NoSQL mm -hmm. database in AWS. So this is the key difference, uh, you know, uh, um, between these two databases. Yeah. Okay. So have you heard anything about network interface and where is it used and why is it used? Okay. Uh, so network interface basically is required um, is uh, for you know so. I basically talk about, you know, in case of uh, the hardware machine, like the PCs which we use, 
the network interface uh, card uh, basically is required for that system to get to connect to the uh, wi uh, internet. So if we, if I'm using a PC and if I have Wi-Fi in my home, so I cannot my PC cannot connect with Wi-Fi. You know if it doesn't have any network inter interface card. So network interface is a primary um, thing which is required. You know for a system to able to uh, you know access the network. Yeah. And by default, the ETH zero uh, interface basically is used, you know, across all the devices. Yeah, yeah. So tell me the differences between uh, SSDs versus HDDs. Have you heard about these terms? Uh, yes, yes. So currently, uh, SSDs are the you know most. Uh, I mean, if, if we basically buy any laptop, you know, today, then the storage comes in the form of SSD rather than HDD. Because uh, SSDs are most uh, fast, you know, uh, from data retrieval perspective, and um, uh, while SSDs basically, um, you know, use magnetic disks uh, uh, to store the data, and uh, data retrieval, you know, the performance related to data retrieval from SSDs are, but is particularly slow. You know, it's not that good as compared to SSDs. Yeah, yeah. And have you heard anything like transitive peering? Do you know anything like what's transitive peering mean? Uh, sorry, I have not about it. Okay, and have you worked uh, with any sort of, uh, you know, VPNs or, I mean, public or private connectivity services in AWS or Azure? Do you know what are the different specific, uh, you know, services that we have for public way of connecting to some services in cloud, and what are the private ways of connecting to cloud? <clears throat> okay. Uh, well, I haven't, but but I can give basically whatever some. Maybe you just give me the name of the services. Uh, sure, sure, want. sure. So uh, with respect to public, like e EC2 instance, you know, obviously we have to make it public. You know, by default it's private. Um, and uh, IGW, IGW basically is sole uh, service is solely responsible for you know uh, to make an, any instance as public, right? Uh, while from private perspective, we can say the database instance. Because database tier is uh, generally considered as private, right? No, uh, maybe I'm looking at. Uh, maybe I should rephrase my question a bit. So I'm looking at what are the different network connectivity models, uh, you know, which goes completely private, and uh, you know what relies on public, what relies on private. Do you know any sort of networking, uh, you know, mode of services that operates in private connectivity where I need to connect from my on premise? to something in AWS or Azure, how yeah. I can establish the connection from my on-premise to cloud. There are multiple ways to operate that connection. Few goes in public ways, few goes in private ways. Do you know any, any services that could come into this situation? Yeah, I think uh, uh, AWS Data Connect or maybe uh, VPN. I'm not. I have heard about these services before. I'm not able to recall right now. But Can you I recollect? Uh, maybe able to recollect Direct Connect. Oh uh, yes, yes. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Direct Connect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, that's fine. So now, um, how do I ensure um, you know I can connect to AWS services or to Azure services? I mean, I don't mind. I'm not telling you, you know, this type of service and etc. But I wanted to communicate privately between these two. What are the different techniques which I can use to establish the communication privately uh, between each other? Like, what are the scenarios that I could think of to host the private communication within AWS or within Azure? Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, tell me with IaaS. Tell me with pass. Okay. Okay. Let's take maybe I could simplify this question a little bit. I have an EC2 instance in a subnet which I wanted to connect to some sort of database. RDS, Dynamo, it doesn't matter. That's a database. I want to connect from EC2 to did RDS privately. Yeah. What I should do. Okay, so firstly, I think <clears throat> uh, first thing is, uh, you know, as a best practice, we need to we should create the replicas of the instances, you know, to support to increase the redundancy, and we can basically, I think, uh, have an uh, application load balance load balancer, which basically uh, in which we can configure the uh, uh, the name of the or you can say the configuration of the uh, database instance 
if we let's say we communicate intend to communicate from application to database which needs to be private then we can configure the uh, setting of the database in the target group group of that application load balancer uh, and uh, you know uh, that load balancer basically can uh, should be, should be able to communicate uh, from the application tier to the database tier do you know anything about aws private link private endpoints have you heard uh, about these services? Uh, I am not able to. I may have heard, but I am not able to recall that. Sorry. Okay. Right okay. Okay. That's fine. That's totally fine. Maybe let me phrase a question in uh, key management services. Um, can you tell me what's the difference between symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption? What are the different protocols that you couldn't think of in each of this just one yeah okay <coughs> sorry uh, so symmetric encryption means uh, um the basically it's uh, when uh, it's related to generation of a private of a key uh, of public key only right while asymmetric uh, encryption is related to the generation of public key as well as private key the public key is something which can be shared across, you know, but private key is something which uh, cannot be shared, you know, which is specific uh, to which needs to be kept in the private state. And uh, private key is generally, you know, uh, kept in the form of .pen files in case of AWS. The protocol which I can associate is SSH, a secured shell, basically. So if basically you have got a uh, local uh, Ubuntu instance on a, a, a local Ubuntu instance in your personal computer. And if you basically need to connect to the any EC2 instance to, through uh, from that, then you need to use the proper uh, SSH protocol to ensure that the connection is security is securely established. So that's syn that's asynchronous. What's synchronous? Um, synchronous is symmetric. Uh, that what you've talked about is all asymmetric. Asymmetric. What's symmetric. Um, Symmetric, uh, okay. Symmetric. Yeah, if you don't know, that's fine. We can. Oh, just... no, no, uh, okay, I'll just tell. Okay, whatever I can recall, I'll just tell. Uh, so symmetric, I think, is when you basically uh, the connectivity is tested, or you can say, uh, I mean, the tested from uh, so not just from the source to destination, but from destination to source also. You know, if basically destination tries to connect back to the source, then I think that is symmetric uh, encryption. Yeah. Not really, though. If you use two keys, that's going to be asymmetric. If you just use one key, oh. encryption and decryption, that's going to be symmetric. Okay. Uh, it's, it's just that how many keys you use for private and, you know, uh, the private and public key pair people use to okay. do encrypt and do decrypt. So that's all in asymmetric. When you use the same key for encrypt and decrypt, that's what symmetric encryption mean yeah yeah okay um i think uh, my last question would be um tell me i mean tell me what load balancer services that you know in aws and uh, what are they what are the key difference between both <clears throat> uh so as far as i know um there basically are three load balancer services a classic load balancer well, well now that's redundant that's not used anymore i think yeah. second is the application load balancer which is i think the most widely used um, you know, application load balancer uh, is used uh, when applications need to connect to the um, instant, basically uh, when the external traffic is required to be uh, connected to the applications, which is hosted in the form of instances. And uh, so for that, basically, we need we have the target groups in which basically we configure the listening uh, listener related, uh, you know, port. Uh, and the port basically at which uh, the um, instance basically need to receive the request. So this is basically how uh, what application load balancer does. And the third one is the network load balancer. Do you know where application load balancer operates at which layer of OSI model that yes. uh, it operates? Yeah. So I think it operates with the layer seven, the application layer. Uh, and which this protocols does it use? Pardon? And what protocols does it use at layer? Uh, so it used, I think, uh, TCP um, IP protocol. Mm, not really. That's uh, sorry, sorry. No, no. It's you HTTP protocol. Yeah, HTTP and HTTPS. You know, if we just you know, secure the you know interaction or you can say the communication. 
Yeah, what's the other one? What's the other one? I think you missed to touch base on the other one, which is level four. Level four. So basically, level four is the uh, network protocol, uh, which uses the um, uh, you know TCP/IP protocol. Uh, and what uh, load balancer layer. is being used there? A uh, pardon? What what load balancer you you use for level four? So it's it's the note, network load balancer, which is used basically for the level four. Uh, but uh, you know, I think it's uh, generally preferred in the scenarios where latency, I think, needs to be uh, as minimal as possible. But obviously, those are pretty expensive. You know, those incur a high amount of cost as compared compared to the uh, application of balancer. Yeah, I think that comes to the end of our uh, mock interview session. I think you have uh, done pretty well. But however, I wanted to give feedback in a couple of areas where you should try to improve the way that you project your interview. Or uh, the first thing first, you have to be brief. So you need to know where to be brief and where to be, you know, lengthy in terms of answering your question. So, for example, uh, let's take a question. I have just asked the differences of route tables versus security groups. Yeah. When I compare two products, there is some sort of similarity between these two products. So just tell me, uh, you know, one simple way, one is stateful, one is stateless. That's it. I don't need to know, you know, what's route table, where is it used and all of that. Okay, it's pretty simple. And uh, uh, probably when I asked uh, the difference between SAST and DAST, there should be one liner. It should okay. not be like a lengthy answer right sure, sure. and uh, and i have also asked this scenario where uh, you know how you know what are the different load balances that you know you know what are they and what are the key differences so that's simple and straight question so you should tell me nlv and alv is what the two load balancing services that operates at level four level seven okay. yeah and uh, the way that it was chosen based on the layer that it needs to be operated, if I wanted some sort of TCP communication uh, to my backend services, I prefer to go with an LV. And whereas in a microservices point of view, where I'm exposing my application, uh, which is at the level level layer seven, uh, mm -hmm. HTTPS or HTTP traffic and coming and hitting my application, I would prefer to go with, uh, you know, ALV. Sure. So the question has to be, I mean, when I pose a question, just go into the, the details of that and just answer along the lines. Uh, maybe, for example, if I kind of ask you to dive deep in um, or cross questioning, um, you know, as an extension to my question, that's <clears> when <throat> you should probably, you know, go a little bit deep into the context on where I'm asking. Right. And sure. uh, for example, that's that's one correction I would like to, uh, you know, probably give you as an improvement. And the yeah. second one would be, for example, you don't need to imagine, uh, for example, it's always happens, right? You don't, you don't have to recollect everything at, at, at the time of the interview. Maybe sometimes we tend to forget. It's a, it's a human tendency. For example, if you are not very sure, not very sure, you can uh you the way that you you should portray that uh is where i'm not too sure but this is what i can really re recollect but i would like to pass on to this question that's it okay just 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 say i'm not sure but i could think of this but anyways i would like to pass this question or okay. if you if you think that's when if you are over 50 50 percent you know yeah. Uh, uh, you know, in tendency of whether it's going to be correct or non-correct. For example, if it's totally incorrect and you're you're trying to answer it, just just tell them upfront that I can't recollect at this point. I would like to move on. Yeah. So these are the ways that you should uh, probably try, uh, you know, improving upon in framing your conversation. But other than that, you have touch based on all the you know aspects in DevOps, Ansible, you have portrayed with Ansible there, but um, it, it's very hard that I didn't get much of the great response to the Ansible questions that I asked. So for example, if you put some sort of technologies in your resume, uh, double check before you know 
applying to the job if you are unsure try reducing um, you know the way that you use it in your current experience yeah because when i see ansible in your current experience i would probably imagine that you are already good at so that's where i probably frame questions around those lines uh, yeah if you are if you need to do a bit of practice and with that gets you that's fine but in your latest experience or in your latest projects make sure you add the ones that you are very good at yeah um i think other than that you did pretty well i'm happy the way that you've taken all the you know questions and try to answer it just that couple of corrections here and there uh, you know as i've suggested once you have once you have made them implemented in your upcoming uh, interviews or preparation i think that would do good and i think i'm pretty much impressed yeah thank you thank you very much and you know and i, I you know I, you won't believe i'm feeling so much encouraged because i thought you know without having real world experience i basically might you know uh, be bad at this interview but yeah, i really? think uh, yeah yeah but you know the i think the uh, hard work with i'm not basically self boasting myself but the hard work which i have done i think that really has paid off so i that's the reason i was able to answer confidently so yeah. i you know feel bit good about myself yeah, yeah. you your confidence was pretty good it just that you've made a very lengthy answers which may yeah. be confusing because not everyone mm -hmm. can go and you know be very intent about all the words that you're speaking so so just go brief as much as you can try to keep sure. it short if interview sure. feels that they wanted more they will try to cross question you yeah yeah actually you know i have this problem actually i am trying to work on that uh, you know speaking the uh, anything in a concise manner is something uh, i you know i lack you know i can speak candidly with you because you know you are my reviewer interview uh, reviewer so this is something i'm actually working on and yeah this skill is something which i actually lack at this point of time so i am yeah. working on that i am doing meditations and you know to basically meditation also i think helps you know in uh, up, <laughs> in basically improving the skills so maybe yeah <clears throat> uh i think that ends that comes to an end of our uh, interview mock interview um i think post the call you will be you know getting the recording of the sessions which you can you know go and probably revisit if you okay. think you might need to you know recollect any of the pre previous questions that you wanted to you know reframe it better in the upcoming interviews whatever yeah uh, i think uh, you will also be getting a note testimonial after the call to submit the feedback on sure. how the call went sure. yeah i think uh, that should be the end yeah thank you so much uh, I, i'm sorry shamila sorry before we just go off so uh, with respect to the skill set you know i understand that ansible because i haven't uh, interacted with ansible for a long time so i basically fumbled in those questions apart from other skills i mean uh, in the other skills apart from you know ansible uh, was my is um, is my you know skill set okay obviously i need to refresh you know kubernetes and other things because i haven't done those for a long time but am i really an an eligible candidate to get into a to get into a devops role or as a devops engineer you know based on my current skill set what do you basically reckon i think on the devops you sounded okay to me uh, i mean based on the expertise or experience that you have but yes there is always a room for improvement uh, you can probably try learning the alternative skills uh, in ci cd process uh, you know you have you i mean i'm not sure how much you worked in depth with ansible but try looking at the alternative alternatives of it try understanding on a high level what's the key difference between ansible puppet or chef when mm -hmm. should i use all of them like or when should i prefer one of them um, or um, and the other scenario where you have only touch based on gitlab in your uh, resume but there are other alternatives like uh, right. github azure devops aws code pipeline etc etc which you could also probably uh, you know try understanding when should i use them or like not every time you know you are be the decision maker of your organization to choose one of it but try understanding the differences try understanding okay. the different yeah. capabilities that it all does uh, more or less is just the same ci cd tools mm -hmm. um atlassian tool set azure tool set mm -hmm. aws tool set, more or less do that's the same mm -hmm. it's just the differences how it operates uh, is what you know makes you stand better um, in terms of devops but yeah i think 
you are good in couple of areas but you need to have an improvement in those yeah okay. but coming to your experience i think you have done on par i would say on par okay <laughs> thank you it's not thank best you. it's not bad it's on par so but it's always to go from on par to the best uh, there's always a room for improvement that's what i'm saying yeah. try to learn yeah. the alternatives try understanding the rational behind one or the other you know how should i do better in learning them i think scripting also can go well try learning the scripting shell yeah. shell you know yeah yeah uh, whatever whatever you are comfortable at i think yeah I, i'm also you know these days i have a got a study plan in which i'm also trying to give time to python and shell scripting uh, basically so yeah i am basically incorporating those things also you know in my study plan apart from devops yeah yeah i think that should do well um, okay. as i said you're on par uh, yeah but but go for best okay sure sure yeah. Best. yeah yeah sure thank you thank you very much really encouraging no for problem. me no problem thanks a lot bye